Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Arden Labs podcast. And our special guest today is someone I get to call a friend, Anthony Starks. How's it going, Anthony? Hi, everybody. Dude, when is the last time we got to even hang out? Dude, it's been forever, right? I think it was in a New York meetup, probably uh, over a year ago. Okay, so let's let everybody kind of know what you're doing now, where, where you are now, like give like the two minute spiel about who Anthony Starks is and, and some of the work you're doing. Sure, right now I've been doing a lot of data visualization work, um, especially just in writing tools to be able to do that. Um, just last week, um, I gave a talk on some work that I've been doing since 2019, that is recreating some of the data visualizations from 1900 created by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, so that's starting to get uh, a little bit of traction. So I'm working on data visualization tools right now. Um, those are all done in Go right now. Um, so uh, that's what I've been doing lately. And I'm very interested in hearing your story and how you kind of developed this passion for the data visualizations and then how you are doing it in Go because we don't think of Go as a tool. No, you don't. No. And I know you've been doing that for a while. So I'm really excited to, to get there. But I want to start, as I always do, right in the beginning. And if you can help a little bit with maybe like what year we're talking about or how old you are, sure. I think it helps to set context. So my favorite question is always, what is your kind of first memory of uh, doing something with a computer and working with a computer? So that would be at the J. Everett Light Career Center in the year 1975. This was um, a vocational section from my high school in Indianapolis, and they had uh, computer programming. Um, and back then, um, I decided, well, computers seem kind of interesting. I think they might have a future. How old are you at this point? I'm 17 years old. 17, okay. So you're still in high school. Correct, this was high school. And then this is an opportunity to start learning how to program. Correct. So we, um, it was very interesting. We, this was the punch card era. And uh, you did all your programming starting on the green sheets where you write it down first. There was the notion of desk checking. I don't know if people do that anymore. But uh, because the turnaround was so long, you had to write your program on these big sheets. Um, this was COBOL, by the way. So COBOL was my first language. And um, you, you typed them up. You typed them up on the key, on the key punch. Um, and you handed it in to the, um, to the operator. Now, one thing that's very interesting, and it talks about sort of the times, there was a mixed class, of course, boys and girls. Um, the girls were meant to be sort of secretarial and that you typed in, you wrote up your program and you handed it to the girls and they would type it up for you. Um, so that just sort of tells you, you know, the roles of the sexes back in those days. Um, uh, but that, that actually didn't last because after a while, it just came more efficient just to type it up yourself. Um, so that's what we did and you handed it over to to the operator and you sort of learned how to do the operations and um, COBOL again was my first language. At the around that same time um, BASIC was around and um, that introduced me to the notion of sort of the interactive programming on on the teletype. So those are my first sort of computing experiences. All right, I got a bunch of questions already that come okay. from this. So my mind is uh, is spinning here. So you're 17 years old. You're still in high school. What was it that made you say, I, I want to go do this? Was it just because you had some other interests? You just saw it? You thought it might be fun? Were you thinking like it could be a career coming out of high school? I did. I thought that, uh, again, around that time, you know, junior, senior year, you think about, okay, what do I want to do next? And it seemed like, well, they, operate, they offered this program and, and I took it. So it seemed like 
I, I, I remember my, my thought process was, you know, I think there might be a future in this. Um, and um, obviously there was. And you were doing this kind of after school? No, this was part of school. This was part of your, this was part of your class. This was part of your classwork. So this was a vocational type thing. So they had computer programming, they had shop, they had body, you know, auto body, all of that stuff together in this one um, section of the high school. I knew you would be asking me this question and I looked it up. Um, this particular facility still exists. So, it, so if you Google the J. Everett Light Career Center, you'll find it. Wow. Now, this place must have been well funded because the computer you were working on, yes, I don't think was cheap. Back it was then. not. So I think it was. I think it was an IBM computer at the time. So we had the whole facility. We had the classroom. We had the key punches. We had the computer room. Um, it was all set up. Okay. So some other questions that pop in my head: Were there women at all doing any of the programming? But I do remember that sort of split between sort of. Oh, just type up your, write up your program and hand it to the girls for them to type it up for you. Um, I'm sure that there were girls that were doing um, the programming at the time, but I, that that particular split um, was something that um, I remember. Now, in 87, 88, the university I went to did have a mm -hmm. machine, and they were just phasing out punch cards. So I never got sure. to program on them, but I'd seen them. But you said you were programming in COBOL, Correct. With the punch cards. Correct. So were you writing cobalt syntax on paper and then that was being translated to some sort of punch? You had these uh, big sheets where you wrote your program and then, you know, all of your logic and everything line by line. Then you walked over to the key punch and you simply transcribed your listing from the worksheet to, to the card. One line of code per card. Wow. So at some point, I have to imagine, and you do this, you're 17, so are you a junior at that point? Yeah, uh, this is my senior year. This is my senior year. And I have to imagine that you get really good at being able to have a mental model of not just the code, but how it's going to run, because you don't want to make a mistake, right? You make a mistake. Correct. Correct. So if you make a mistake, then it's back to the drawing board, and you have to start over. So... Um, Again, when I went to college in again starting in '76, this was the punch card era. Um, so I was able, for example, to skip the the introductory uh, computer class because I had the the high school stuff, and then we went straight into um, assembly language um, on the IBM computer. It was the exact same thing, um, punch cards. So this experience you had, I guess it led to the idea of that I'm going to go to university yeah, sure. to learn how to write software. Talk to me a little bit about your parents at the time. Were they completely on board? Did they understand this in 75? Were they technical? Uh, they weren't particularly technical. My father actually worked um, for IRS for many years. So um, he, he understood finance and that kind of thing. Um, I think they just said, well, if that's what he wants to do, go for it. But you're learning, I guess, because there's almost no choice. I mean, really low-level computing skills right. at university, right? So throughout the, I'm assuming, a four-year program, mm -hmm. you started with punch cards. You started learning assembly on these uh, IBM machines. Correct. Like, what was the highest level of abstraction you got to experience <laughs> okay, in, that, sure. in those so, four years? Right? So again, freshman year was, was IBM Assembler. Um, but then I went into, um, so the way the program was set up, you could either take a commercial option, i.e. COBOL and so forth, or a technical option. I opted for the technical option. So that meant Fortran. You're going for assembly to Fortran, then a programming language that most people don't know now called PL1. Um, PL1 was sort of if Fortran and COBOL got together. Um, <laughs> and had a and, baby. <laughs> yes, correct. <laughs> correct. Um, and, um, and we just continued from there. And then there were courses in things like 
structured programming, which was a new concept at the time. Uh, you had your math courses along with that. So yeah. So again, to answer your question, the highest level was things like Fortran and um, and NPL one. Were you interested in something else, and were you even doing some of that in university? I did. I, I was always interested in in the arts, and I'm very very interested in photography, and I still am. So uh, I did uh, a bit of photography uh, again in college. I continued to do that, you know, throughout college and, and even in my life now. So I'm very interested. So in terms of quote hobby, um, that was one thing that was very interesting to me. But before you ended up going to that vocational school mm-hmm. as part of your senior year, did you have any clue what you want to do? Was photography like? It was sort of, um, I would have loved to have been able to do that, but I was a bit more pragmatic. My parents were pragmatic. So my view was, all right, this is the career course that I'm going to take, and let's, uh, let's take it as far as it can go. I see. So you, you didn't have to really think about it until your senior year when you went into that. Correct. I got it. I got it. Correct. Now, I'm really interested quickly because my dad was totally into photography. And I remember mm-hmm. as a little kid, the black room with the red light. Oh, yes. Doing all that, right? Oh, yeah. And I remember when I got him his first digital camera. It was like I paid a lot of money for I think it was like a 96 or 97, sure. like $1,500 for the first digital right, camera. Right, And he really tried to learn it because of, F, you know, I, I'm not a photographer, but... I mean, that industry and that equipment's come a long way from the time you were doing that in 75 till now, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so again, I, I, I kind of like the, the analog nature of it in that, you know, it's very hands-on. Um, but, again, digital photography is a revelation. In, in those days, um, you had to sort of, you know, take your shot because you were working in 35 millimeter, um, 24 to 36 exposures. Um, and you were very careful um, to, to do that. Even to the point I worked with view cameras. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Those are the cameras, you know, have you seen the old-fashioned one where the guy puts the, the hood over his head and he looks at it? Yeah, um, I've seen I mean, I've seen them. When they're operating. Yeah, so, so in, that, in that case, you're working with one piece of film at a time. So, again, there's, there's a craft to that, right? So you have to understand exposure and you have to understand all of the processes for for so forth so i think now that i think about it that whole notion of being able to craft the thing to make the thing sort of carried over into in computing as well because that's what you're doing you're you're going through some well-defined steps but you're also being able to apply your creativity to be able to get out the 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 final product but i think there's also an aspect of knowing that one, you won't really see what you accomplished right. until later. Right. And so That's your true. your mental model of light and background and camera placement had to be incredibly strong because this was your only shot and you weren't coming back to this moment in time, unlike today with the digital. But you know, we keep doing it until I like what I see. And, and again, it's sort of like again the the turnaround in the punch card era was you better get it right, and you toss it over to the operator, and if it blows up, well, you got to go on you know, the other round. And forget about it if it was the end of the semester or you dropped your deck. Um, yeah. yeah, we're <laughs> not worked. talking five minutes. We're talking what? Like worst, best case scenario, a couple hours? Yes. Worst case a day? Correct. If yeah. it was in the semester, forget it. We always used to hate it when the engineering students came because – they were just taking the computing stuff as electives, and they would just come in and flood the place. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious as we continue here how much of sure. that training you're able to really leverage today. Because I think a lot of that's been lost in, in a lot of things that we do because of the instant gratification of everything. That's today. true. And, and, you know, I like the instant gratification that we have now. But, again, some of the tools that I write now sort of go back to that view of thinking about what you're going to do, pushing the button, and then seeing the result. Throughout university, were you taking a minor in anything as well in university, or was it just heads down? Uh, it was pretty much heads down. I don't even recall what my minor was at the time. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty much, you know, 
just the, the, the math and the and the computer uh, science courses to be able to, to get to that. And I'm, I'm really curious, too, because I don't know the city that, that you, I mean, I'm not really comfortable with the city you lived in. I don't know what industry looked like. I imagine if you were in the capital region of New York in university working on IBMs, that IBM was the the job option. So what was kind of as you're now graduating, what were your opportunities coming out of university with this degree, which is still new, and only big companies would have these computers? Yeah, it was it was fairly open ended. Um, I, I think I only looked at a couple of companies and I wound up in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so, you know, companies like Eli Lilly was around um, in that area. Um, Dow Chemical, which is where I f finally started to work. Um, so, yeah, so I, I started my career uh, working in 1980 um, in the pharmaceutical um, industry and, and stayed there. What were they using the computers for at that? Because these had to fill a room, right? This wasn't... They were. They were still, and, 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 and we'll probably get to it. So I've been lucky to be able to see the transition from, you know, the punch card era to the personal computing era to the internet to mobile. Um, I've been able to see all of those things. But yeah, they were, you know, we had computers on site. Um, we were, they were supporting, you know, the research. So one of the things that we were doing um, at the first job was doing data acquisition um, for animal testing. So they had back in the labs um, animals that they were working on, monkeys and so forth, and they were working on cardiovascular drugs and so forth. Um, and they had those connected to um, PDP machines, so um, digital compute, digital. Um, and we were doing real time data acquisition. When you say data acquisition, are you mm -hmm. talking like sensors? Correct. That were, that were relaying information, and then you were recording that to magnetic disk, I guess, or? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So they would instrument the, the animals, you know, rats, or in this case, monkeys. Um, and they would, um, you know, check their, um, their, their vital signs and so forth. And they would do um, signal processing on, on the data and so forth. So the idea was, you know, just support the, um, the research. I didn't realize in the 80s, some of that Oh, yeah. kind of tech was already existing. Oh, yeah. But did you find that kind of from a tech perspective? I mean, I'm sure you weren't doing that in, in university, right? So No, we weren't. This was we cutting weren't. edge stuff at the time. I mean, you must have been uh, maybe technically like excited about the idea of being able to work on. This had to be cutting edge. I, mean, I was. I was. It was very interesting. But what was your job there? Were you helping to do any of the, the programming? Or? I was. I was just um, working on the programming, making sure that the computers were working correctly, you know, writing programs um, for analyzing the data. Um, you know, back then, uh, again, you know, data visualization and charting and that kind of stuff was, was interesting to me. And we had packages back then, um, SAS and so forth, which still exist. Um, we use those for um, data analysis. Again, our, our job was to support um, the scientists in the lab. What was the output of this analysis? Was it graphs? Was it sure. printed paper? Was it graphs, charts, um, that kind of thing? So, again, if you if you try to understand the the pharmaceutical um, business, it's an interesting business in that it has very very long lead time. And it also has lots of failure modes in that you can, you know, work on a particular drug and spend years and lots of money and it gets to a certain point in clinical trials and it doesn't work. So you have to start over. Um, you have to have many candidates and so forth. So um, it's a long process. I remember one of the things that uh, my boss was a statistician. And one of the things that they did was to support the FDA um, submission for a particular drug. Um, Nicorette, which you can get off the counter now, 
over the counter for, for smoking cessation at the time was a prescription drug. And I worked at the company um, that developed that. And I remembered, you know, doing and working with the, uh, my boss working with the, um, the submission for that drug. And you're doing data science too, before we had labels for all these things. Yes, correct. Who decided, or was it just clearly obvious what type of analysis you were looking for in the data? Who decided that? You know, the, the scientists did that. So, so they would know, obviously, if you're, if you're working and doing clinical trials, um, it's very regulated um, and you, you kind of know what kind of analysis that you need to be able to do. Um, and again, back in the day, it would take boxes and boxes of documents. This is before everything was all electronic. Um, you, you gather and you do the work and you would physically submit the, the work to the FDA. It's better now. Even better now, but even there, I imagine they got rid of a huge amount of pencil to paper and collecting the numbers. Again, yes. Wow. So, so we again, doing the real-time stuff, that was way preclinical, right, before just to make sure, you know, doing animal studies to make sure that, you know, it, it, it would work and it wouldn't kill people. You know, what's interesting for me, this is the, you know, this is 1980s, early 80s, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we talk about how technology displaces certain classes of jobs, where now we have to kind of retrain and re-educate. I mean, in the 80s, a whole bunch of jobs were lost, I imagine, to people who were basically just doing data entry on paper to now, I mean, it's, I don't know why that pops into my head, but. Yeah, I think, you know, those, those kinds of jobs would, would slowly be computerized and you would go on. So going back to that first job, I remember when, you know, word processing was first introduced, right? So that concept was very, very new and, you know, I would work with the secretaries who would, you know, usually be doing things on typewriters, right? And now, okay, we can start to do these things, you know, with computers. Um, people probably don't remember the Wangs. Remember those? The Most people don't. That's, I'm, I'm dating myself. Um, but that was sort of the first kind of dedicated word processing station before all of that stuff moved to, to PCs. And again, when I first started the job, PCs didn't really happen. But I do remember in 1981 when the first IBM PC was, came out. Um, that was a big deal. Uh, I remember driving uh, up to the Chicago area to actually see it um, with, with one of my colleagues. And that was a revelation, right? So before everything was, you know, backroom computers and now suddenly here's a device that sits on your desk that you can control and you were kind of evaluating that for the company we were like... we were we wanted to see how could this be used again this was you know, again 81 these were early days of personal computing do you remember what you were thinking when you saw that machine was it like oh was it like i can have one in my house was it yes Yes and yes, but you know, again, they were very, very expensive um, at, at the time. Um, so if we want to go to sort of my first sort of personal computer, the Spectrum ZX81. Um, again, this was a very small computer. I think it probably cost under $200. Membrane keyboard, basic built-in, um, but it you hooked it up to your TV. You did all of your storage on cassette. I had one of those. Oh, my God. I, yes. I can never remember the name of it, but I think I got it from Radio Shack. Exactly. The Spectrum ZX81. Um, so, again, this was sort of my, my beginning of my journey of a computer that I could have for myself. And when did... Do you remember what year it was that you... Uh, that had to be like 82, 3, something like that. Yeah. yeah. I think I was like, I think it was in that year too. My parents came home with this cassette player thing that you hooked up to your TV. Correct. And I could start coding in basic. And I burned that machine out in like two weeks. And then they yeah. got me a K-Pro. Exactly. 
So how long were you with that pharmaceutical company? From 80 to 90. From 80 to 90, you were with that first company. That's correct. And the, the explosion of tech there. So how, wh what were you doing in 10 years later there? Were you r running? You must have been running the place after 10 uh, years. No, I mean, just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so during that 80 to 90 time frame is where I discovered Unix. Um, and again, that was a really seminal um, time for me to really understand, um, again, you know, personal computers and even, quote, mainframes at the time, you could run Unix. We, we had terminals that connected to Berkeley Unix, and that was, again, a revelation. And understanding that notion of, you know, working in the shell and piping things together and small programs and doing one thing and one thing well. Uh, that was really, really important again in the mid 80s. Um, and I began to build up those particular skills in, in, in Unix. Trying to manage and solve their data and data analytics needs at the time. Yep. How did visualization change for you in those 10 years? Because now I imagine that you could do I don't, I, I was in university in the 90s, right? But we had color monitors at that point. We had sure. things like that. So from a visualization standpoint, how was your life changing in terms of reporting? I hadn't really gotten the, the big visualization bug yet. That happened much later. But again, um, you know, the big output devices during that era were plotters, right? Yeah. Right? So yeah, remember yeah, plotters? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, yeah. I would write programs to, to drive the plotters because that's how you would, you know, get your output. My dad worked at Grumman Aerospace, and I remember in 90, 91, mm -hmm. sneaking into uh, a couple of areas where they had the big plotters, the tables. like Correct. Big table with the arm in the middle of it, and I saw it doing the schematics. Yeah. Right. That's right. That was the big thing yep. back then. What were you putting on the plotters, though? Because so again, I, you know, just your your charts and graphs and that kind of thing that you would do for out. your scientific uh, work. Okay, so what makes you decide after ten years to leave, and where did you end up going? I ended there? up so that was um, again in Indiana, where I was born and raised, um, and that landed me in New Jersey, where I am now. Um, again, I was just looking around. Um, for other opportunities. Um, so, so at the time, I was very interested in, and I'm still interested in, you know, speaking at conferences and, and, and sharing the work. And I, you know, had done some really interesting work in my mind, um, but my boss didn't agree. He said, why are you spending your time on this? Um, and that sort of, you know, prompted me to say, you know what, what else is out there? Um, and um, I saw, uh, again, this was again in 89-ish. Yeah, you're just about 30 now. Like, like you're, you're, you're finished with your 20s, you're entering into your 30s. Correct. And Correct. you're starting to think there's got to be more out there than what I'm doing. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So uh, again, just, just as, as an aside, I've always been interested in space and space exploration. Um, one of my dreams would, would have been to, to work at a place like JPL. Um, that never happened, but again, when I see, for example, the Perseverance rover and that kind of stuff happening, I'm still very interested in that. And, you know, part of me says, what if? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> what if I had, you know, gone and worked with those guys? So, anyway. So, so where again, do you end up? Um, yeah. Yeah, I saw I saw an ad. I think this was you know really early days online somewhere um, for another pharmaceutical here in New Jersey, and um, I took the plunge. So I moved uh, myself and my family um, from Indiana to New Jersey, and I so stayed. that so that first ten years, you're also you 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 get married, correct, and 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 you have a family. Yes. Did you do this? To better support the family too, or was this really for you intellectually to be doing? I think it was else? just um, it was a time to to see what else I can do. Um, so at the time, 
Um, I, I interviewed with um, a company in New Jersey and also the big pharmaceutical in Indianapolis, Eli Lilly. And I had offers from both of them. And I had to make a decision. I could, you know, stay where I'm at um, with, a, with a large pharma or I could move. I decided to move. What about your, your, your wife? I mean, you had to have that conversation, right? Of so. course, of course. And, I, and I, have to, I have to give her all the props. She was extremely supportive um, for making that move. And I have to say that my children are also, they were young at the time, but they grew up in New Jersey. And when they go back, they say, I'm glad we moved to New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Were you just outside of the city in New Jersey or were you like south of the state? So New Jersey is a funny place if you're, yeah. if you're familiar with it. Um, very, very dense um, and, you know, lots of little town, you know, there are large you know, urban areas like Newark and so forth. But then you've got lots of little towns all connected um, in a small area. So um, I landed in central Jersey. Um, in central. Because that's um, that's where the the firm was. That that puts you like an an hour out of New York City, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Okay, so you're really kind of in the the suburbs, not even the suburbs. You're, you're it's really I, I more. I guess of they a call rural. them bedroom communities, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Right. A little bit more. Uh, but no, in that area, of New Jersey, it's beautiful. Okay, so you moved there in in nine in the nineties. Mm -hmm. How old are your kids? Because are you pulling them out of school, or are they at a point where they're ready to start? So uh, I have four children. Um, at the time, the oldest was eight years old. No, nine years old. Um, and then um, the next one was five. Um, so my nice. kids were fairly young. I only had, I think, two in school at the time. And then my other two were, were fairly young. So they very much grew up in New Jersey. It was a good time then too, because once, yes. once once they're in the end of junior high school, like you never make these moves because you don't want to disrupt Correct. their. So it was a good time. And how long are you at this new pharmaceutical company? That was the one that I was at for seventeen years. So yeah. now you're there to two thousand and seven. Two thousand and seven. Right. Whoa. Okay. So you when you commit to something. Anthony, that's it. Your, your, your feet are in the sand. You're going to make the most out of that. I tried to, yeah. But you must have had, over 17 years, a whole slew of different roles. Um, I did. To keep you interested, right? I did. I did. So, uh, again, I mentioned that my journey into Unix that I started at, at the previous firm. And, you know, the, the company in New Jersey were looking for people who had Unix experience. So I grabbed it. Um, so that was kind of a system administration kind of role. Um, but one of the things that I have done is I'd like to keep my skills up and um, evolve my roles into whatever it happens to be. So that morphed into many other things. So one of the things that, again, this is in the early 90s, um, people don't really recognize or remember that the internet as we know it now was completely different then. Um, you know, there was no World Wide Web that was widely known at the time. Um, but again, my job was to, to support the scientists and being able to connect to the internet, um, I felt was um, a big way to be able to do that. But management was completely skeptical at the time and I remember having to go before management to say this is a good thing that we need to do so this was the day you didn't have firewalls um, if you did the whole notion had to be invented um, if you recall um, it's interesting um, Bill Cheswick was another guy who people may or may not know, but he was big in um, firewalls. He and Steve Bellavin wrote a, a book about um, internet security. Again, this was in you know late 80s, early 90s. So 
I ended up, in order to connect our company to the internet, building our own firewalls um, with computers, standalone computers, and writing the software to do the connection. So for probably the first couple of years, all of the mail to that particular domain went through software that I wrote. So we had to write our own SMTP servers and those kinds of things. And the services that we did were, you know, mail, SMTP, um, and then gradually we would support other kinds of things like the web and so forth. So that's where I learned and used those Unix skills and built up the networking skills and understand TCP IP and understanding security. That's, that was my role there um, at, at that job. And I learned a lot. And that's what you did for 17 years. You were on the, on the ops side, really focused around security. Correct. So it was all, it was a means to the end, right? So we needed to connect to the internet. So, okay, how do we do that? Um, well, we need a firewall. Okay, let's build one. Well, well but Anthony, let me, I'm going to step you back for a second. Sure. Because I don't think that was obvious. Maybe it was obvious to you. But I remember back in the 90s when we had offices all over the country, we were getting dedicated T1s yep. to connect everything. Mm -hmm. We never put anything on the Internet. I mean, the Internet, I didn't see it until 96, right? Right. But, but we were just switching traffic on dedicated T1. I imagine you had some of that too. Not everybody was in the same building. We did. We did. What you're talking about is really brand new at the time, right? I'm sure most executives for sure had no idea, like, why do we have to do that? No idea. What's going to happen? Correct. <laughs> so, you know, so the big deal uh, was computer viruses. What's going to happen? Um, will we infect our company? So what I had to do was, you know, anytime the data was scanned through, I had to build my own virus scanner. And I wrote that to, to, to watch the data as it goes through. So, you know, it's probably primitive by today's standards, but these are the things that we had to do in order to get connected. What I want to know is, where were you learning these things from? Was it purely reading was it just purely obvious was it because you said you'd like talking in the conferences and stuff sure. i really want to know where all of this kind of came from for you to say we've got to do this and we've got to do that and we've got to do this uh, just just learning and understanding you know seeing things that are out in the world so one of the books uh, again that, that helped me was uh, a book by bill cheswick and steve bellavan from bell labs um, and I must say, again, one of my ambitions back in the day was to work on Unix at Bell Labs in New Jersey. Um, I almost got there. Um, so, you know, the, the, the place where, where Unix was built is probably a 15-minute drive from my house now. Um, and often when I go by there, I think of all the things that, that happened there. So... So just being in that community, reading news groups, um, talking to people. For example, Bill Cheswick helped me write um, some of that uh, mail server. You know, I was working that and said, how do I do this? And, you know, he shipped me some code. Um, mm. So, um, you know, I've always, you know, had a network. Um, but again, just learning and doing and, and having um, a bit of boldness to actually just go out and do it. Because I remember when we were in that meeting with, with management, they almost didn't do it. Um, so my boss's boss was presenting, and I'm in the room, and I see it sort of slipping away. <laughs> so I had to stand up and say, you know what? The virus thing, I think we can handle that. I uh, hadn't written anything. Um, but I figured I could do that, and I did, and that's how we got on. So I have to tell this particular story. Um, management was so paranoid that they just didn't connect the, the company to the Internet. So you had to go through a process to get your particular IP address validated 
to go through the firewall. Um, and it was a whole paper process, and you had to get people to sign off. And we called them golden IP addresses. <laughs> um, so it was a happy day when we finally got to the point where we could get rid of golden IP addresses because that was my job, actually, <laughs> configure the firewall and put these IP addresses in um, so that people could connect to the Internet. You're like whitelisting IP addresses. Correct. It's crazy. And you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Correct. But but I have I have questions because sure. you're writing the beginnings of virus detection. You're writing the beginnings of these types of services. I want to know two things. How are you testing this? And are you trying to, I guess, it, like, it's almost like you have to implement chaos engineering here a little bit, right? How are you testing this stuff? How are you really making sure? And what are you doing in case you didn't catch something to kind of have some sort of mon monitoring it? There's so much to this. It, it was. So um, the testing was, well, let's program this. Let's see if it works. And we put it in. Um, I remember, for example, um, I had misprogrammed um, how to do DNS for MX records for the SMTP. Mail wasn't flowing. Um, so it was on me to find that bug and fix it. So again, I don't recommend this to anyone, um, but that's how we did it back in the day. I imagine using, you're using C to write? Correct, this was all in C. I'm just curious, in the 17 years that you're doing this, as much as you can say, did did you ever have a breach? Did any of the software get attacked? And not on I mean, my have watch. To not on your watch. <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> 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 that I know of. I'll put it that way. Yeah, I don't know okay. if I could have slept at night for the last seventeen years. No, it was that. tough. It was tough. And again, you know, that was the beginnings. But eventually, we would, you know, move out my stuff and put in commercial things. You know, you know, we would buy software. You know firewalls off the shelf and we get rid of my my janky stuff and put that in so it was a whole process to get to the point so you know after you know by the time i left i was out of that business um other people had done that you know we you know it was again it was a happy day when just being connected to the internet was boring so now in 2007 mm -hmm. you've done 17 years your I'm going to make a statement here. You're bored because all the things you were doing, now there's off-the-shelf appliances for, and right. you've kind of done everything that you can there. So what's your mindset in 2007, and where do you go next? So in 2007, again, I had moved from this kind of programming and operational thing. So, again, in the mid-2000s, the whole, this whole notion of um, IT architecture um, became a thing. Um, and, you know, I was involved with that and trying to define what that was. Um, and it was, it was a struggle um, because it was a new concept, um, having people who aren't really, quote, making anything, but designing the solutions for, for an organization. Um, and, you know, at the time they said, well, you know, Anthony, you've been here um, 27 years, and we're going to eliminate your position. Okay? Also, also known as layoff. <laughs> so here's a package. Take it and enjoy your retirement at 50. Here's a package. Take it. Um, so I took it um, with not much choice. That was uh, a turning point. Because you're young, Anthony. You're only in your 50s at this point. You're Correct. Right. Correct. I mean, but here's cash. And you can go off and do something else, right? Yeah, and, and that's where I jumped into consulting. So, so again, I did consulting for mm, a couple of years. Um, and that's when this whole notion of data visualization and, and, and that kind of thing really, I hit the bug. So it was in 2007, after the layoff, that I discovered a program called Processing. Um, processing was created um, by a couple of engineers and artists who wanted to meld those two ideas together. 
Um, so they wanted to have a programming environment that they could give to designers, that they could give to art students, um, so that they can do a thing called generative art. If you will, you tell the computer, combine these particular objects together, and then you'll get an art piece. Are we, when we say objects, because I'm so visually, I'm so artistically sure. um, ignorant here, and uh, one of our producers, Andrea, who's an artist, is laughing at me now. When you say you're putting, are, you, are these shapes? Is Correct. This, so okay. so it's, it's very interesting. Um, so they're the things that you would think about um, that you would use in an illustration program. Text, lines, shapes, polygons, arcs curves. And from these kind of basic things combined in very interesting ways, you can do an awful lot. But what is it? What is this, Anthony? Wait, wait, wait. What, what is it that that was interesting to you about this? What was it that got your... Because I don't see a practical reason for this just yet, right? This, sure. is, my, this sure. is my ignorance in art. So I mean, talk to that. What was it that I will? Buy? So, so, so part of it, you know, again, it was it was meant to to bridge the gap between art and code, um, and you know, in my job, you know, as a co IT architect, one of the things that we did is we would, you know, make PowerPoint decks, right? And in those PowerPoint decks, you've got boxes and lines and things like that that would describe, you know, the architecture of your solution or your firewall or, you know, how you're going to lay out your servers and that kind of thing. Um, and one of the things that struck me was this is really repetitive. This is, I could do better than this. I got really tired, again, during those consulting days of, you know, building these diagrams and that kind of stuff. And I realized I can make the computer do this and I can be much more efficient. If I can describe the relationship between these things and then push a button and boom, there is the fully formed thing that I want. Again, driven from data. So you put in the data, you lay things out, and there you go. And you're not laboriously pushing pixels around. So. Are you, this is almost like UML part two, like you, you designed a DSL kind of, in a sense? But, but again, what we would do was, you know, you're, you're constantly kind of, again, PowerPoint was the lingua franca in, um, in, and still is in the corporate world. And, you know, you use PowerPoint or maybe Visio or something like that to build these particular diagrams, right? Sort of like I saw you do at, at the meetup um, using that kind of thing. Right. Um, so when I see that kind of thing, I'm thinking, what is the structure? What are the objects? What are the things that make up that? And what are the relationship between them, those things? And then if I can discover that, then I can program it. And then I can make the computer do the, the hard work. OK. So, so, and what Anthony's talking about is I do a lot of whiteboarding. Can't do that on a remote meetup. So I use Lucid Chart and draw boxes and color them in and draw lines. And I right. use it as my whiteboard, right, on the fly. So you're, you're, let's say between 2007 and 2010, you're really getting into this yeah. notion of, it's, it sounds to me like why so many people build tooling even into their editors, and they build little tools to Correct. remove the redundancy out of their lives, right? Correct. So now we've got like 10 minutes left, so i got to move a little bit here. So sure. you're doing this kind of work with that program. When did you discover the Go programming language? How, if this is the work you're doing? Sure. So, so again, this was in 2010. I'm sorry, 2009. I was still consulting at the time. Um, and I saw a post on John Gruber's Daring Fireball about it. And I was very much intrigued. I said, hmm. Because I'd followed, uh, again, because I've been a fan of Unix and those kinds of, of things, I knew about guys like Rob Pike. 
So when I saw, you know, he was connected to it, I thought, this could be interesting. So as Go was first open source to the world in November 2009, that's when I picked it up. Oh, and, wow. Okay. Really? And, and, you know, I've been doing that as sort of my go-to language ever since. Um, back in the day, I'd sort of played with Java to create SVG because, again, SVG... Uh, scalable vector graphics is the web um, standard for doing the kinds of things that you would do in processing, right? So it's got text and graphics and lines and arcs and curves and a, a language to be able to, a markup language to be able to describe those things. So one of the first things that I did in Go um, turned out to be SVG Go, was a way to generate that. And then from there, using those tools in order to build those diagrams and visualizations and things like that, that I would use um, um, in my work. Did you struggle using Go? I remember trying to clean up images using Go, and it was a, it was a struggle. Did, did you feel at any time like, you know what, I'm working twice as hard as I need to here. Let me just switch tech. Like what kept you in Go, or maybe you um, didn't feel that way. It it sort of again fit my mental model about how a programming language should be. Um, I done C again, you know, back in the day, so I sort of understood C style languages. But it you know it had garbage collection, so I didn't have to do worry about that anymore. Um, it was well structured, you know, with functions and that kind of thing. Um, and it allowed me to do what I'd like to do, which is build tools. Again, back from the Unix um, heritage, I love to build tools that you can plug together to get a particular result that's bigger than, you know, the, the sum of the parts. Um, yeah. So, so Go was very great for me to be able to to build those kinds of tools. And and because you know. Because I'm working with a description, so for example, if you're going to draw a line in SVG, it's pretty simple. You just you're programming with printf, if you will. Um, you're just saying, okay, here's a line. It's got this beginning and this end, and boom, there you go. So once you've got, you know, a series of functions to that correspond to each of those high-level objects then it becomes easier to be able to combine those things together. So I, I often think of the quote from Carl Sagan. It says, the beauty of a living thing is not the atoms that go into it, but the way those atoms are put together. Um, so he's talking about biology and so forth. But I like that same kind of thing. So from these very primitive things, you can build very beautiful and intricate things. And now, basically, 10 years later, yep. you're still using Go for these things. I am. I'm, I'm curious, how much native Go are you able to do 10 years later that was still requiring maybe C libraries? None. I never do C Go. I, well, um, back in the day, probably about 2012, again, I wrote graphics libraries for the Raspberry Pi. Um, and I needed to access the lower level um, graphics, and I had to use Seago for that. Um, that was the only thing that I've used Seago for, um, for, for my own code. Most of it, because again, I'm working from declarative things and markup languages, I don't need to, to go to that. Today, you're still mm -hmm. an independent contractor, Yep. right? And What's some of the work that you're doing today that hopefully still allows you to connect all this visualization work you're doing? Like, yeah, what's some so, of the work you do today? So, so right now, again, the, the, the tool that I work mostly in is a domain-specific language called DeckShell. Um, Deck is a markup language, again, similar to SVG. Um, to describe text and graphics on a scalable canvas. Because I wanted to do that to be able to, you know, again, do the presentations and those kinds of things in my way, right? Because 
you know, I, I didn't like how the commercial ones were working, so I, I built my own. So, you know, I'm sort of getting into, you know, illustration and data visualization. So behind me, you probably can't see it, but there is a, a poster of some of, again, as I mentioned earlier, the visualizations of W.E.B. Du Bois, who, you know, the civil rights leader, socialist, so, social worker and so forth, social scientists, who wanted to present the progress of African Americans in 1900 from emancipation to then, to that time. And he presented this in Paris. Again, you know, it was a different era. But one of the things that he did was create about 60 very colorful, very forward-looking visualizations to make that story. And I discovered these again back in you know, 2017. Um, and I have these tools that I'm working on. So I embarked on a, a journey, if you will, to recreate all of those using those tools. So that's what I've done. And again, I've learned a lot. I've learned, you know, what it was like going from analog. These were, you know, big poster sized things with watercolors and hand drawn to doing them digitally. Um, again, learning and building tools, you know, you know, for charting and graphing and that kind of thing, for doing all of that. And, you know, again, it's, it's melding that art and code together, right? If you look at these and, and, and show them, you know, on, on the screen, they um, are works of art, but they are also socially aware in telling a story. So I'd like to be able to do that as well. And I'm going to, after our conversation, get those links so we can sure. share that with everybody. And, and maybe some more links on the, the history of that, because I, I saw you had entered this and mm -hmm. I didn't. I, I didn't make the connections that you were just making. I didn't realize how important that artwork was and, and that those images were and, and what they represented. Now that I do, I want to take a closer look sure. at the work you did. So let's make sure that we, we get those links in there. Sure. So we're, we're at the end of the hour. I just want to ask you at least one more question. You've been sure. in the industry mm -hmm. essentially since 1980, mm -hmm. right? You've gone from r very low level punch card programming to Unix to building the beginnings of firewalls and SMTP servers and um, and you've worked your way from back into a visualization um, passion which I'm going to say you had in photography back in the day um, and you have your own company where you're, you're you're helping out on the tech side of things, but what's the future for Anthony Starks? What should I, what am I going to see from you over the next year, three years, over the next decade? Hard to say, hard to say. Um, again, I, you know, I, I want to continue to, again, this notion of, you know, bringing art and code together and, you know, maybe, maybe I'll get into teaching and, 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 and sharing this with, with young people. Um, to really understand, you know, one of the powers that I have, and I call it a superpower, is to be able to program. So, um, and I'm fortunate to be able to do that. I don't, I don't want people to be limited by the things that they can buy, but you can only be limited by your own imagination for the things that you can actually build. That's awesome. And I would love to figure out how you could develop a talk over this work that you just done so we can sure. present it and, and teach people and even teach people how to do some of it. I think that would be a really wonderful workshop that maybe we could help put together right. for yep. this year. That would be amazing. Yep. All right. Let everybody know how they can find you on the Internet if they have any questions or they want sure. to just talk to you about this stuff. You can follow me on Twitter at, at AJ Starks. Um, all of the work that I've been talking about before is on Speaker Deck. So whenever I do a talk or if I'm doing some artwork or doing some work, I'll push it up on Speaker Deck. That's speakerdeck.com slash AJ Starks. 
Um, everything that I do is up on GitHub. Um, github.com slash AJ Starks. So you'll see SVG Go. You'll see um, the Du Bois work. Um, recently, I have to throw this in. I've been working with a couple of Go graphic toolkits, um, the Fine Toolkit um, and Geo. So I've been working, you know, the same kind of things that I'm building, I want to be able to build interactively with those toolkits as well. So you'll see a couple of um, toolkits based on those toolkits as well. So GitHub, so if you see me, AJ Starks, so anything slash AJ Starks, it'll, you'll see it. That's amazing. And you really are helping the Go ecosystem push beyond just text in a console window. So right. that's fantastic. <laughs> All right. That's the time we have. Okay. I appreciate so much you spending an hour with us. I, I can't thank you okay. enough. Great. Bye, everyone. So this is Bill Kennedy with the Art and Labs podcast. Thank you for all sharing the last hour with us and hope to see you again real soon. <laughs>